pumpkin spice. Welcome to Stittsville, the most grim part of Stittsville. We're down here on Main Street, a lot of history took place. We're about to hear about some of it. You ready? Not till nightfall. At nighttime tonight, our adventure begins. We're going to hear some spooky stories. One about Steve the Barber. We'll be starting here at nighttime. On this busy Stittsville thoroughfare, here in, here in some haunted heritage. Here's a story about Steve, right in there. We're gonna head over to where you'll be hearing a couple other tales. Tales that I had heard of before. This, this would be pretty intriguing, so pay attention as nightfall falls. Try to get what I can get. And make sense of these stories that are about to be told. One about this, what this building was in the 1800s. Looking forward to this. Right here in old Stittsville, there was some history that happened here. Might hear about that, but there's one story about a drunken executioner I keep hearing about. And I've heard this before, so I've spent a lot of time around Stittsville, especially as a kid. So now there's this place here, the Jack Ketch. And Jack Ketch was known as the drunken executioner back in the 1800s. I think it was 1800s. So you may hear an intriguing tale of, well, the Jack Ketch, drunken executioner story. We're gonna get, try to include that tonight. Hear what that's all about. Yeah, Stittsville's got a lot of old buildings and there's a lot of stories, including some that are gonna involve the train tracks down here in Main Street Station, which is now you know, been redone. But you're gonna hear true tales about what happened to people from this building up here. We get a little closer. There's gonna be an interesting story about this place, which is now housed by a psychic. Psychics! Palm and card reader. See that? But the truly thing, and remember this, is what went down beyond these two top windows and why they forever remain blacked out. So stay tuned to find out why. So right over there, right over here, barn market's going on. We'll catch some of that later. Just over here, Stittsville Street Station. It's gonna be an interesting story that leads us back over here and the story of this middle window right there you see that middle window well again it's blacked out and there's a reason behind that true tale you can make of it what you want whether you believe in paranormal or not but that tale starts over here the old Stittsville train station and ends over there where we're gonna go next before we hear these tales check out the quick farmers market over here real quick here in the village square it's got its share of haunted heritage and history. We're gonna go through it. A lot of it stems all right here. This is the main part of town. So you're gonna hear the guide tonight talk about this stuff. Let's, let's check out some of this farmer's market first before we get to these nightfall and the spooky tales. Then sure. This guy's ready. You look like you're ready for Canada Day. Yeah, yes, I definitely am. Or is it a Halloween costume? Right. So yeah, we got Mr. Canada walking around here. Thank you. Doing Thank some you. charity stuff. This is where your haunted heritage tour begins. Right here. Not, not This was not the train that rolled through town. But this does represent where the train came. This was the Main Street Station. Right now they got a farmer's market going on. All kinds of good stuff. Look at that. Oh, it looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Time for bacon. What's this stuff right here? 
Lemonade mix. Lemonade mix. Oh, yep. wow. I love the pumpkin bags. You know what? I probably All kinds of cool things. things. Look at that. Doesn't that look yummy? Mm. Only at Halloween time. I always don't get coffee. Mm -hmm. Only at Halloween right time. Here. Yeah, I like the coffee. Oh. Yes. All kinds of cool mixes over here. They got a very good farmer's market right here. Wow, look at this big pup. How you doing? Hey, no, no. <laughs> he says, no, no. A little, little skittish. He says, keep your hands to yourself. Yeah, just side Main Street Station where we'll be tonight. Hearing some of these true spooky tales. Getting me great. This, this lady knits. All these amazing, amazing things. Nice caps. You do great work. Thank you. Yeah, little ghosts. Ghost caps. Is there candles and stuff? Look at all this. Love Halloween. Everybody loves Halloween. I love how they bring all this out. You get quilts, blankets, all kinds of stuff. This is open every Sunday. This is not part of the Haunted Heritage Tour, but showing it anyway because we'll be here tonight hearing true stories about the tracks that ran through here wow Ew. Is that pumpkin latte soap pumpkin latte soap apple cider donut oh my goodness that looks good. This B, he's shopping. He's, he's like, all right, I, I'm gonna take one of these pumpkin latte soaps off you. Peach milk. All kind. Of, all types of honey, honey meal. And, oh, wow. That's some nice. Have have shown a fair bit of honey on this show. So look at that. Look at the size of that bee. Did you make all this honey bee? None of my beeswax, eh? None of my beeswax. Did you do all this honey yourself? It's like honey mania over here. Good deal. It's all over here at the barn. Look at the gorgeous fall setting. You get it all at the barn. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good, good. This lady's selling peppers. Flowers, oh, we love pumpkins. Covering all things fall here. Yes. Plenty of this stuff, wax candles, fall decor, ooh, wraps, pickled hot peppers, herbs, fresh baked bread. We got all here right outside the barn. Only open one day a week. Sunday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. right there. You get fresh produce, all kinds of stuff. It's a good place to buy it. Especially in October. Autumn harvest season. Gotta cover a farmer's market. Very good. Can't wait for some of the haunted tales that have taken place here. And uh, we will. It's gonna be good. Look at that. There's some old witch that brews back here. Old witch. Legends, folklore, and other tales. Today's adventure brings us to the Stitchville, Stitchville Haunted Heritage Walk. That's right, they give you tours. I'm not gonna give away the whole show. These are kinda creepy. But I will catch what I can. Show some of the legendary buildings. Stitchville Haunted Heritage Tour. All right, let's see what they got to offer here. Get us spooked. Legends and folklore. Spooky masks. <laughs> Group's taking a walk now to the first stop. The guy was just informing us of this. This looks creepy in itself. This building yet to be constructed. It also gave us uh, flashlights. What the heck are we going to use these for? Guiding our way through darkness, perhaps? Let's take a look at the human being. Try to include as much of the story as I can while keeping the tour open. People want to come and do this and not know the stories. Like I said, we're just taking a trek to the car's coming. 
but it's Saturday night and it's disco, so they kind of roll up the streets sometimes. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, so there's only a few of you from Stittsville, so I'm going to give you the brief history of Stittsville, okay, very quickly, all right. So now, Stittsville actually goes back to the early 1800s, okay. Basically the turn of the century in 1800 from 1799 to 1800. The reason why it's very old is because this was actually where all the soldiers from the Dominion Wars of 1812 settled. So remember the wars, the Napoleonic Wars? Well, there was actually the Canada-USA Wars as well. And Canada fought in that. Well, it wasn't Canada then, it was called the Dominion, right? So after the war, what was called the 100th Regiment, okay, of Dominion soldiers was really decimated. They lost a ton of guys, okay? They fought hard, they lost a ton. So the ones that were left, they decided, of course, it's time to retire. Thank you for your service. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to give you 50 acres, we're going to give you 75 acres, we're going to give you 100 acres. Here's some, a bag of money too as well, okay? Thank you. So that's how Stitzville started. They had the choice. After that was done, Stitzville started but it wasn't Stittsville until 1851, till Jackson Stitt, who was the postmaster, okay, decided to put his name on the incorporation papers and it became Stittville, okay? Mm -hmm. But it kind of sounded like Titville, so they changed it, they added the S in the middle, okay? And I'm glad, because then we wouldn't have all funny making people. <laughs> but Stittsville became Stittsville. Now in 1870, on August the 17th, there was a great fire, but it didn't start here, it started outside of Elmont. Those of you who know where Almond is, it's a pretty little town. This is where they do the movies. You're gonna have to move a little bit. Um, okay. They were laying railroad track and they actually had to do what was called a control burn. What I mean by a control burn is, is that if you come into a lot of brush like this, it's really dense and heavy, but it's in the way of the tracks and how they planned it. Well, you gotta burn it, okay? Because you don't have the tools like you had today. So you have to burn it when it gets all the way down, okay? Uh, you level it off, get her nice and flat, boom, there's your railroad tracks that go in. So that's what they were trying to do outside of Elmont. But the control burn got out of control for three reasons. In August, it was very dry, it was very windy, and it was also very hot, okay? The wind temperature was very high. So, what happened? The control burn became an uncontrolled burn and it started to spread a lot. It spread all the way to Nepean. So if you think about where Elmont is, Okay, it came, it kind of it kind of did Stittsville, okay? We're not really around the main area of Stittsville. If you know where independent grocers, if you were coming down Main Street that way, that's actually where the town hall was and everything, and that all got decimated from the fire. Because it was dry, the cornfields caught, okay? When you drive out to Elmont and you're on Dwyer Hill Road and you see Burnt Something Road, there's a reason why that was named that, okay? And that was because it was basically burnt and singed. 250,000 acres. Wow. I know people are like, what? Great fire of 1870, 250,000 acres, all the way into Pan. Didn't got almost to Richmond. That's why you have some really cute houses from the early 1800s, but you've got nothing here. Mm -hmm. So people ask the question, like, why? Is this like a black hole? No, well, it was. Um, more like a burnt ash hole, okay? And I'm freaking out because they don't know where their kids are. And they get out of the wagon, they're starting to look can't see anything but then out of the one of the fields the kids do come okay so whatever they did however they did it it made them safe just long enough okay to be able to be able to reunite with mom and dad so that was okay the only problem is they couldn't find Joshua Joshua the project manager of all this wonderful stuff okay unfortunately perished he was one of the 36 fatalities by the way in that fire of 250,000 acres. Everyone saw it coming, but some didn't, okay? And some tried different. So he was one of the 36 that perished, unfortunately. But he was a hero because he saved his brothers and sisters. Now let's fast forward to the 50s, 1950s, okay? This is Basswood, this is Orville, okay? Basswood, Caribou, some of the older streets in Stittsville. Also Manchester is one of the older streets, Abbott is one of the older streets, of course, because the Butler family lived on Abbott and they had the Butler Hotel, which we'll talk about later. Um, Caribou. It has houses, or it did have houses that looked like the ones that were in the Brady Bunch. Do you remember the Brady Bunch? No. Somebody did something wrong. You kind of had this uh, community uh, arrest type thing, 
okay? And the village people, not the group, the, the actual <laughs> village people, um, would get together and, and um, uh, do a citizen's arrest on the perpetrator. Um, and this is exactly what happened. There's a gentleman by the name of Lucas, okay, who's a Stittsville resident, or priest as well, I should say, was accused of horse thievery, which is kind of like Grand Theft Auto back then, okay? Mm -hmm. It is very serious. So the townspeople got together, and in their own actions, they decided to gather him and put him in the basement in a room and notify the constable, because that's what they had to do. The constable would come from Bytown in a couple of days, he would take him to Bytown, and his trial would happen. That's exactly what was happening. Lucas was put in the basement room. Um, the postman would come, see, we, we, we ask as much as we can. We find sometimes it was bi-weekly, sometimes it was monthly, you know, with the horse and the mail, okay? This was before the trains were, were built, okay? Because they didn't have those things back. So if you had to isolate for a year and a half, imagine putting you in a room with no windows, you maybe get 15 minutes of time outside a day. Yeah, that's not great, okay? Um, so Lucas is getting a little shaky-wakey, and uh, he asks for a guitar because he plays the guitar, and this is how he passes the time. So they give him the guitar, and all that's fun and everything, and Lucas is there. Three weeks go by. Now this is serious, because usually it only takes a few days. Um, four weeks go by. Same thing. You can hear Lucas playing, okay? He's passing the time. Gets his 15 minutes whenever they can let him out, okay? Um, four weeks go by. Five weeks go by, six weeks go by. They've sent a number of requests at this point back to Bytown. So it's, it's, it's not just a matter of fact that, that, that they're slipping up, okay? Don't forget, there's, there's no facts, there's no texting, okay? It's like, this is pa it's a, some papers in a bag and somebody reads it. Um, finally, it's, it's well over into two and a half months and Lucas is still down in that room, okay? Um, eventually, close to three months, the constable shows up, wonderful. Um, <laughs> But by then, uh, Lucas has stopped playing the guitar. Like, you don't hear any sounds anymore from the room. They're still getting him out, you know, and sometimes he just doesn't want to come out, he just sits. So he's pretty well broken at this point, as you can probably imagine, okay? And it's a situation I don't wish anybody to be in, but psychologically, he's just done, okay? They finally get him to Bytown. They're preparing him for his trial, so they're coming back and getting information, okay? So that's taking a heck of a long time on top of that. We don't know how long that took, but believe me, this is enough of, enough torment. But eventually, on the day of his trial, they come down to get him, and unfortunately, in his cell, Lucas has hanged himself. He has decided to check out, which is not a big decision and a great decision to make, but he did. Um, the foundation did anyway, the top part of it was burnt. Um, so it remained and it was rebuilt over the years. Um, it, it was. It, it, was, it was a storefront for a while, it was different businesses. Some of the records were really unclear as to exactly what businesses were there. But it eventually became, and this is the really funny part, it became a guitar store. And it was managed by um, Scott, who were going to go past his house. His parents actually managed this, this guitar store for years and years and years. Um, so it was very much music again that was attached to this building. And the energy of music was attached to it. Um, then it became vacant. And it was vacant for years. Um, and then it became a pet grooming place, which was, again, different, right? Um, and, uh, uh, Rick O'Shaughnessy actually was the manager there up until, unfortunately, with COVID, he, he left. Um, and so Rick had a couple of funny stories about people who used to come by. And even before it was quitters, people would walk by at night and they would hear music coming from the building. And they would always think that a band was practicing or something and doing this. No, 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 there was nothing like that. Kathleen only played in that building starting last year, by the way. That was the first time she actually did a live performance there. Um, wow. Jim Bryson has done some, of course, at Christmas. It was his Christmas show there. Jim um, Bryson. Yeah, that's the yeah. energy. That was what people saw, and the legend is that Lucas is still playing, okay? Especially late at night, um, to drown his sorrows, and to just get that message out to people. So that's Quitters. And yes, uh, if you ever come in, Kathleen will talk a little bit about that. She's kind of cool. She's shy, but she's kind of cool in there. That's okay. Some of them were basically cut up into smaller subs, okay? Maybe for descendants of the family or whatever, okay? And this was basically a forest, okay? 
um, going all the way down, I guess, to where you would find the Ferguson farm, okay? Smaller patches of farms. And when I mean by small, I mean 10 acres and whatnot. In one farm in particular, there was a small family, mother, father, and two kids, which back then was small, okay? And they were working their small farm, um, I guess mostly for corn. We couldn't really find out exactly what the staple they were growing was. But they were pretty good. One particular evening, everyone was asleep, and there was a big, loud bang at the door, okay? <coughs> father gets up to answer the door, and there are two gentlemen standing outside, obviously intoxicated, obviously belligerent, and demanding money from him because they thought he owed them money. This gentleman did not know who these people were at all, never saw them before in his life, so basically said, thank you very much, starts to shut the door, but the gentlemen are belligerent, they're intoxicated, unfortunately, so the discussion that was supposed to be curt became an argument. Argument became very violent, and in the violence that ensued, unfortunately, the father was stabbed, and fatally stabbed, okay? The mother rushed to his aid from the bedroom, and the two other perpetrators sort of launched themselves on her, and literally beat her to the point where she was unconscious. And she was unconscious. The younger daughter and son, of course, seeing this, being awoken for the melee, okay, decided to sneak out the window and run into the forest and hide. Smart move. Why not? Okay? Decided to pursue them. Torch in hand. Okay? The children ran over into this area and eventually hid behind some trees. Shaking as they can, literally frightened to death. Okay? But seeing the perpetrators, seeing the two gentlemen entering through the forest by the light of the torch. Eventually, as they became closer and closer, the children were really becoming very scary, okay? But then all of a sudden, and from what we got, the son never spoke about this, never talked, period, six months after this incident happened, like never uttered a word. He began to talk eventually. The daughter began to talk a while after the incident, and this is her story. As the two perpetrators were coming towards them, looking through the trees in the forest, it seemed as if there were dark shadows coming in behind. So very much like, you don't cast a shadow right now, but if I put the light to you, you're sort of casting a shadow, but there's a larger one behind you. It doesn't make sense. It's not normal, okay? And you're right, it isn't. So they watch this, and as they watch the shadows become larger and larger behind these two men, all of a sudden, the shadows engulf the men, and the torch went out, and all was silent. Children eventually were discovered. Um, the wife, by the way, regained consciousness, although she was very severely hurt. Unfortunately, the father lost his life. Um, they were descendants of a family called the Flewellens, by the way. If you're familiar with Flewellen Road, and if you go to the United Cemetery, oh. just at the corner of Fernbank and Maine. It's just there stone, today. Tombstones of the Flewellen. Just family. did an episode on that cemetery yeah. today, and I saw the Flewellen yeah. stone. Interesting story. We also had a corroboration from the First Nations because um, uh, if you know, I guess, Jim and all that, and, uh, I work with uh, ISI Live, who's a streaming company, and we do First Nations. Um, and uh, we're actually on unceded Algonquin territory, by the way. So this is a non-treaty. Unfortunately, there was no treaty. <laughs> the plan was just, you know. There's an Algonquin legend about the spirit, Oweho, okay? And Oweho, oh no, okay, it's hard to pronounce. Um, is a spirit that protects the innocent when they're in danger. And so the legend is that the Oweho came upon this and rescued the children. And that's the Oweho legend. So you didn't know you were on unceded territory, but you are. Most of this stuff is. And that's the legend we're able to finally get for this year. So I hope you enjoy it, but that's apparently what happened. So now, if we're going to go, we're going to go back in the path, and you see the brown building over there with the white trim? Uh, when we do cross the street <coughs> on that brown building, I want you to look at the very top window, and it's kind of rounded. It's in the middle. Okay, take very good notice of that window as you're crossing the street, and still watch the car. This building here, there's the white, the circular window in the middle that he was talking about. We're going to hear the rest of the story now as well. We get the whole group across the street from the train station to this creepy building. Yeah.
There's the building here. There's that circular window he was talking about. Which you saw from the distance. about the, the train park. The trains came here until 1990. They brought all the types of materials to rebuild Stittsville. They brought workers too, okay? You need workers, right? And that's what they did. So the trains came back and forth. There's actually three tracks here, but you're actually standing and sitting on two of them because they actually brought, they kept the rails. See? Wow. They kept the rails and embedded them so the rails. into the ground. You're sitting on railway ties, by the way. Oh no. Um, and the switching equipment is right behind you guys. Yeah, I was just showing the equipment. That's awesome. These are the tracks there. These are the tracks and what I'm learning about. So, yeah, a little bit of memorial here. There is a plaque by here if you want to look at it after. Okay. Or even during when I'm telling the story. I'm, I'm cool with it. Uh, the Butler Hotel was built for that specific purpose by Samuel Butler. Okay. And his wife and two daughters, Lala. And I believe her other name was Rose, I'm not sure, because she died when she was really young. Um, the Butler family ran this as a hotel for the simple reason is because they could use it to house all the guys that were coming to rebuild Stittsville. So it was a very prosperous time, okay, unfortunately for the fire, but fortunately to be able to rebuild Stittsville. So that's what they did. Very busy, very busy, very busy, up until about 1900, okay. It was still busy, but... On April the 1st, 1900, the oldest daughter, which was 18 years old at the time, her name was Lala Butler, was playing on these tracks. She had a white dress on, we're not sure why. It might have been for a confirmation, you know what I mean? Or some sort of a religious activity. Um, she was playing here on April the 1st, and unfortunately her foot got caught in one of the ties, okay, that are switched on, and she was caught, and the train came and basically decapitated her. For those of you, that's cut right in half, okay? So she died instantly. It was very tragic, very, very tragic for the family. Samuel Butler and his wife, because they had a daughter that was younger and she died of natural causes, unfortunately, when she was young. That happened right here. She got- Right here. She got cut in half right here. Yeah. That's insane. Um, well, it could have been there. Could have been right there. It was in this vicinity. Yeah, in the, in the, okay. in the general direction of, uh, the, yes. Absolutely. So this is where it happened. And of course they were distraught. They sold and moved away immediately. But there's an epilogue to the story because some people have heard this okay. before. But we're going to add some new stuff to it. Um, Luke Terrier and his wife Nancy run Stittsville Glass and Sign. They have been for 20 some years. I've known Luke for uh, 17 out of those. Okay. Um, great couple. Fantastic couple had some health challenges and were able to go through that and still build the business. Luke has been very busy the last year and a half because one of the products he makes is called Plexiglass Barriers. It's kind of like being the only guy with candy in the theater, okay? Yeah, so he's been really busy on that stuff. But before that, years before that, Luke has some interesting stories that he wanted to share and as a few other people in Stittsville did. So, Luke's working late one night because he can because he runs the place and he has lots of windows in the building because another thing he makes glass. Um, so he's got a pretty good vantage point of anything that's happening here. He's not there right now but usually some nights and during the tours if he's sitting in that bench he actually comes over here and he answers questions which is really nice. I should actually start paying him to do that but he just sits because he's catching up on his mail. But anyway um, Luke is working inside the shop. One of the cars that we saw maybe turning left here, pulls over to here, turns left into his laneway. Guy jumps out of the car, leaves the door open. Car's still running. It's in park, thank goodness. Um, and wanders into the park. And Luke's like, okay. Walks out, car's still running, car's still in park. Lights are on, walks into the park, gets down to almost where we were in that train building, okay? And the guy's standing there. And so Luke's not sure, this could be, you know, slightly psycho. So, you know, he's keeping his distance, like we do now, okay? And asks the guy very nicely, is everything okay, buddy? Like, I'm cool, like, are you all right? And the guy says, oh, he says, that's, oh, he says, that's you. I go, yeah, it's my parking. You pulled in, okay? I am so sorry, sir. I am so sorry, he said, but I was sitting there on the light, signal on, and I look over, and there's there's the girl, 
and she's in a white dress and she looks like she's crying she looks like I don't know what so she said I pulled in she said I just pulled in I thought you know I don't know maybe give her a hand that's all Luke's had a couple of these situations happen one time where the guy actually went up on the curb here um, and then went into the park and we've had joggers have the, 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 the double take and it's like what's that and then you turn around and there's nothing there still looking for something maybe because of a sudden death maybe because of sudden separation she's caught in between something I do special effects guys okay I'm not into like paranormal I can make you scared okay I've never seen a ghost I, I gotta be honest with you but I can make the rocking chair rock and all this kind of stuff and I could probably make a hologram appear but what these people are reporting is not that okay and it still happens now and then everybody's kind of comfortably numb now in the last couple of years but before they always saw the girl in the white dress and it looked like she was always so confused. Yeah, story number two because they were they were married two separate husbands okay as the 1930s rolled into the late 1930s Canada of course was getting involved in World War II which started in 1939 okay now into the 1940 1941 okay the husbands of these twin sisters were called to war to serve under Canada unfortunately they both lost their lives and I don't mean I, I'm not sure if it was like saving private Ryan or whatever but it was like they they pretty well died in a very short period of time one another the twin sisters were again traumatized and totally broken by this um, and they kind of as stupid as it was they made a pact and that pact was they were going to join their husbands because they loved them so much and they were twins right so instead of talking about it instead of picking up a phone which you couldn't do right they decided they decided to hang themselves in their rooms which they did and they were discovered unfortunately sadly and tragically like that when we started to look at the stories in 2016 to 2017 we started to you know like how many stories can we get here and i talked to a man by the name of john curry and john curry said oh i know you need to talk to that guy because John knows everybody, and he knows everything about Stittsville, and Richmond especially. And, um, well, we started to find out stories about the renovation of Green's Hotel. But, um, as you can see, this is not a, a building from the 18, late 1800s. I mean, it's all been fixed up. New frames, new concrete bases to the windows, the, 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 the verandas, PVC, it's not wood. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, shingles, all that kind of stuff. They were putting a lot of money into this because they wanted to re-rent it to other businesses and they had apartments upstairs. So as they were finishing the renovations, um, the stories I was getting was that I noticed that the, 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 the gingerbread and that, that top curved window were never finished. Everything else was done. It was kind of like this 99.2% project. And I was like, why didn't they finish that? Why didn't they finish that? So I kept harping and harping and harping. I actually got to talk to the son of the owner, Craig, who lives in the basement, okay? Um, and Craig explained basically that they had a contractor up there. He was finishing painting the gingerbread and then he was starting to paint the frame of the round window. But then when he looked through the window, he saw a silhouette of two women hanging from the rafters. Oh, Jesus. And he immediately got down from his ladder, put his brush down and proceeded to you can finish that sentence, okay? And basically say, I ain't doing that. That's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm fine, okay? You get somebody else. I'm cool. And of course, uh, contractors, especially tradesmen in this area at that point, all talk. And uh, that's why it wasn't finished. But as you can see, it is finished now. So what am I talking about? Like, okay, Joe, you said this, you said that. Why is it all painted black? You cannot see inside that window from outside at all, period. That's how they were able to finish the work. So they spray painted the window black, contractors went up, finished off all the work, and there you have it. If you go into the apartments, by the way, which I have been through this building, there's a wall that's in front of that window, and there's a wall on the other side that's in front of the window. So that window is in a very small room, and that's how they finished it. Maybe that's how it had to be. But that is the Butler and the Greens Hotel. So. We want to go over here. We'll talk about the Alexander Hotel. It started and just consumed the building. We have fire stations down the street, okay? Uh, the one down there, we have the brand new one, but the one was just down here. So by, even by the time they got here, they found it highly uncontrollable.
they did eventually get it under control, but it basically raised the building down to about 50%, just like that. Uh, they did an investigation for a year and a half and they could not find, still find the cause of the fire. They had some questionable, they had, they had assumptions, okay? Because they thought it was arson. Because nothing goes that fast, right? Except in Goodfellas when Joe Pesci lights all the stuff, you know, in the restaurant, okay? That's what happens. But no, it doesn't burn like that. And also, who would want to burn down a restaurant that is making that kind of money? Duh. Bring them out everything but they do come back sometimes and they're pissed off <laughs> so that's the story of the Alexander Hotel those ghosts the third hotel is right behind you guys ironically there's a second it's all so this is what you really um this was the small of the three hotels this handled the other um, these two prominent gentlemen were on the veranda having their coffee with a kick, their extra, you know, whatever, you know. Anyway, uh, one of them had too many coffees with a kick, leaned over the balcony and fell. Oh Sometimes it's not how high you fall, it's how you fall. He fell head first on the cobblestones. Anyway, unfortunate as it was, it was a tragedy. Everyone moved on. But as you can see, we have a habit in Stittsville. We do. You know what the first habit is? When something goes wrong, call bye bye. Number two is we spray paint windows black. Don't we? Oh, oh. too many crickets. Okay. The reason why is seeing a man sitting in the cabin. Maybe they've had too many coffees with the kick, I don't know. But they've had a couple of reports, so therefore, poof. See no evil. <laughs> Two black windows at the top. Two blacked out windows again. And that's the story of the temple. Um, there's nothing upstairs, by the way. Get a closer look at those in a minute. Just a bunch of stuff. There are apartments on the second floor. Nobody has reported anything. There's been no ooh. And the psychic doesn't talk to me anyway, so I don't know. <laughs> there's those two windows you talk about. This one's smashed out. The other one is blacked out. I can see some ghosts living up here. And this red sign. Yep. This is Psychic. This is the Psychic place. So that's kind of creepy. Yeah, there's two windows, just like that blacked out oval one in the previous story. That is creepy. This is the Jack Catch. Um, it's not really a ghost story, but it's more of a humor story. I know some of you have heard it before in the other tours, but I like to always tell it because people really enjoy it. Um, does anybody know who Jack Catch was? You know, you're the first one who did that. Execution. Okay, okay. all right, good. Okay, come on, you know, no. Um, <laughs> no, that was really good because nobody Drinking has execution. guessed it at all since September. Every Friday and Saturday night, two tours a night. His body, okay? Um, so that was Jack's job. Um, the king appointed him. And Header. basically, he was the guy of Friday afternoons, right? Okay, there's no Netflix, there's no cable, there's nothing. I'm serious, there's nothing, so Grey's Anatomy. All right, so this is what you did on the Friday afternoon. You got the kids together, you made some popcorn, went down to the town center, and you watched the people get waxed, <laughs> so to speak, right? Um, anyway, so that was Jack's job. And has anybody ever, has anybody here ever had a job you didn't like? It's like a ready kind of job, you know? It, 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 you might still be in it, and I, and I really hope that you get out of it. I really do. Um, or you did, and you just kind of got out of it and went, oh, thank God. I can't believe that. I can't believe my boss was like that. Well, Jack was kind of like that, okay? Jack was in a rut. So, number one. Number two, Jack was paid two ways, okay? He was paid in, he was getting five to seven pieces of gold each time he showed up for a gig. I know that sounds silly, but that was, that was how he was paid. And he got uh, things for ale. That's beer. I know, it's another booze story, I'm sorry. Now, most of us, at the end of the week, will celebrate maybe with a glass of a cup of tea, our favorite tea, our favorite drink, maybe wine, maybe beer, you know, maybe before the swimming in the morning, um, or whatever, you know, like, you just, hey, um, and, uh, well, see, Jack, Jack didn't like what he was doing, okay, I'm gonna say, I've said it enough, so Jack would imbibe the food, and imbibe. 
because Jack's ten sheets to the wind. He's, I, there's lots of terms we can use here, but let's start with that one. Okay, severely intoxicated, okay? Showing up, don't forget, a broad axe is 65 to 75 pounds. Ask anybody that does medieval stuff, okay? Yeah, it's pretty big and heavy. So now, you're, you're pretty hammered. It's Friday afternoon. Maybe you can't even focus or you see four of everything, okay? Now you've got to swing the axe and you have to dispatch your client. <laughs> Okay, that's good because, yes, that's exactly what, that's the vision, okay, you can't unsee it. In 1685, actually, he was actually ordered by the king to execute uh, the illegitimate John, uh, son of one of the, the princes, okay, because they kind of fooled around and it was, you know, really bad. This is what happens, and so that happened. So Jack showed up to do the job, and basically, it was, I think it was four or five times the charm, because he was pretty inebriated to begin with. So the first swing hit the guy in the head, not in the neck. The second swing hit him in the shoulder. So now it's death by, it's the separation by installments. Okay, the third one, okay, the guy hits him in the back. The fourth time, he hit him halfway in the neck. And Jack oh, dropped man. the ax and went, I can't really do this, okay? <laughs> okay, oh, oh, I'm okay. No, 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 no. Um, so Jack was kind of, but the king ordered him and actually, uh, they gave him a knife, so he had to finish the job. Oh, so that was Jack. Yeah, I know. Eventually, but that was a big turning point for the king, because, like, I guess he didn't show up for a lot of this stuff. But now that he was there, it's like, oh, I didn't know there was that type of an issue. Why don't we deal with it? Um, you know, or let's start a committee. Uh, or basically what they did is they let him go, and they replaced him, probably with the severance package, too. <laughs> but anyway. Hope you all made that out. That was the story of Jack Ketch, the drunken executioner. Pretty cool. And the food here is to die for. Or to work. Oh, that's work. So yeah, wild. yeah. All right. The eyes pop out, like the plastic pops out, so you can actually see with it, or you can leave it in if you want. Um, that was what they used, and they used to use the these um, scents and all that kind of stuff and herbs because it would protect them. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> and it didn't. Okay, but we have seven or eight of them. For $49.95, you get the hat, the mask, the two-ply inside. You also get the, the stand to put it on. And then for another day of his life, as a matter of fact, does anybody know anybody that's in the Canadian Armed Forces? Okay. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, hold on. I'll throw that over there. And... Free haircuts by Steve for military, ex-military, and veterans. Barbara on Main, uh, from November the 1st to the 11th, not just on November the 11th. He does that every year. So for 11 days, he cuts all the guy's hair for free. Stuff around. And then as he's moving it around, he starts to feel sick. He starts to feel nauseous. Doesn't feel well. Decides to take the day off and go home. No big, because when you're a barber and you're sick, you can't cut hair. Period. Comes back in a couple of days, feeling great. Okay, starts to do stuff. Rick is his partner here at that time. And decides to go back upstairs to move stuff around because he wants to finish the measurement because he wants to put the ad in, okay, to see what kind of response he can get. So he starts moving stuff around, starts to feel sick, starts to feel nauseous, starts to feel dizzy again. Goes home, same thing. This happens about three or four times over the next few weeks. Uh, Steve is not a hypochondriac, okay? He's not that type of person. He's um, concerned now, so he goes to the doctor as a battery of tests. Doctor comes back. He did have a bypass at one point in his stomach, but that was a while ago and that's nothing to do with this. And the doctor says, you're fine. I don't know, maybe you caught a bug four times in four weeks, but anyway, says no more, say no more. So Steve is, um, there's a guy named John Curry. I mentioned his name before. He's a very prominent man in our area. He knows a lot about history and whatnot. And John's friend, okay, Tom is getting his hair cut here and Steve is cutting his hair and Steve is mentioning as he does because he's in a conversation while he's clipping you okay and he's talking about this and that and how he felt sick and it was like yeah it was when I went up you know there's got to be asbestos up there or something and this kind of stuff or aliens or I guess you don't know the story to which Steve says no tell me please clip 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 um, the gentleman tells him the story of this house Again, 
Remember we talked about the depression? We talked about prohibition. We talked about what needed to go on. Even for residences and people in homes, it became a rooming house. This is how you had to get the extra coin in. And you help people from being homeless, right? There were no homeless shelters. So this is how it was in the 1930s. Getting better, re, you know, rebuilding. So they rented the upstairs to an older couple, no children, but they'd been married for a long time. They, everyone in Stittsville apparently had known them and they decided to take residence in the upstairs. So they did. And everything went fine. It was great, fantastic. Um, they were very happy, okay, still rebuilding. But then all of a sudden the wife became sick. She became ill. We're not sure what it was. It's not the Spanish flu because it was the 1930s and that was pretty well done by 1924. Okay. So he took care of her, doting as he was. He loved her, stayed by her bedside. She was fine. And then all of a sudden she took a turn for the worse. And she passed away. Unfortunately, he had caught whatever she had. He must have because within a week to a week and a half later, he passed away too as well. Again, still with her in the bed. Uh, it's not a disgusting story. They didn't wait weeks or months to find them. They did eventually find them very soon, but they had tragically passed away together. So now that Steve hears this, he's like, okay, kind of weird. Say no more, guy leaves. Thank you very much, okay, and continues. Steve continues, eventually starts to go back upstairs again. Um, again, is hit with this mysterious type of illnesses or symptoms coming down when he's working there. And instead of, and Steve's not, Steve's not in the paranormal. Okay, if you want to come back for a haircut, please do. He'll fill you in on it, guaranteed. He's not that type of guy. But instead, what he has decided to do is kind of flip-flop again. So Steve decides to address the situation the elephant in the room, whatever you want to call it, okay? And here's what Rick, his partner, the attest to as well, was that he hears Steve starting to talk upstairs as he's working, and he knows that nobody's upstairs, so Rick is starting to think that, you know, Steve's a little wackadoodle, but nevertheless, he's listening to Steve, and Steve's going on like, I'm sorry. Listen, I'm here, okay? All right, I'm here. Um, sorry, and asking, you know, can we chill? Can we be cool? Whatever. So he keeps doing this for about two to two and a half weeks. So he's going back and he's going back. He's still feeling sick. But eventually after a couple of weeks, the symptoms start to ebb. And then another week later, they kind of disappear completely. And now he's okay. Now he can go up there now. So whatever it was, Steve addressed the energy. He addressed whatever, whether it's passion or whatever it was, it's an energy that we all leave in the world. We all do. Okay. Um, on October the 17th, 1984, my mother passed away at the Queensway Carlton Hospital at 5.20 p.m. I got there at 5.50 p.m. and my dad was still holding her hand, telling her how much he loved her after 46 years of marriage. It doesn't matter how many cars you have, how many yachts you can water ski behind. It's at that moment when you realize it's okay and you did good, and you loved as much as you can. So the only thing we can think that Steve does, he addressed this somehow, okay? And he made peace with it, whatever it was. But the one thing we know from this story is that love never dies sometimes, it stays. Thank you. Oh, look at that, crazy nails. This place is crazy. Woo, look at those chairs, tight. All right, so that was pretty good. This heading off from the Haunted Heritage Tour. That was pretty good. They got some pretty good stories in there. So, just taking my leave. Hey, look, a honey store. I'll make that out. That's pretty cool, some of those stories. Yeah, it's pretty intriguing, uh, whether you believe in the paranormal or not. Some of those stories made a lot of sense. The one with the little girl and the train tracks and the oval window. I've spent so much time right here on Stittsville Main Street. Never know any of those stories, but now that I do, I'm gonna keep those in my head. So I hope you enjoyed it for what it's worth. Hopefully you can see me like, subscribe, and uh, yeah, just in time for the rain to hit. So we'll see you next time on the Mr. Thrasher Show. Never know what we're gonna be doing. All right, signing off for today.
Goodbye.